Hello and welcome to Happy Mum, Happy Baby, Parenting SOS. Now every week I get to bring you honest, heartwarming and hilarious conversations about the highs and lows of being a parent. And on Parenting SOS, I get to explore parts of parenthood that we might want to know a little bit more about with the help of experts. In this month's episode, we're focusing on sleep. Now, sleep is one of those things I can guarantee no matter who you talk to, all parents want to get more of it. Yes, please. I would like some. Maybe we just sleep this whole episode. Maybe I just put a bed under the table. I'd be very happy with that. Well, today I am joined by sleep sisters Eve Squires and Gemma Fryer, the women behind Calm and Bright. Calm and Bright offers information, support and guidance on sleep training that doesn't have to feel overwhelming and I am so excited to have a chat with them today. Hello Eve and Gemma! Hello! <laughs> Hello! I mean, it's already been a giggle and we haven't we even have gotten to the, the, the reason why we're actually here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a blast. It's, it's been a blast. But I'm looking forward to talking about sleep. I really am. It, it, I'm glad that you are because that is what you're an expert on. Yeah. So if you were here and you're like, nah, yeah. not today. No. Not I don't today. know. I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Troubling. <laughs> of course, Andrew, but your voice is really calming already. Oh, thank you. People do say that, you actually. Lovely, calming I send voice. people to sleep. My yeah. poor partner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's talk about sleep. It's a weird thing, I think, that sleep when you are, pa- are a parent, when you're a mum, it weirdly becomes a controversial topic. Yes. How does, does, yes. how does this happen? It's so emotionally charged. Yeah. It, it's such an emotive topic because as mothers and, and fathers, you know, we're programmed to respond to do sleep for our babies, which is exactly what you should do in yeah. the early months. And I think it's contentious because there's no one way to do it. Mm. And and it's so heated. It's it's yeah. the same with feeding, G. I often liken it to the feeding yeah, debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, people feel really strongly about it either way. Yep. Um, and it, it, I think the reason is that it seems to be that feeding and sleep are perceived as reflections on your worth as a parent Mm. that's why but it's not at all so I think that's why we feel so strongly because we almost have an identity as a for for me as a mother my identity was that I was a responsive attached parent who believed in xyz you know barefoot feeding on demand um, tried to do good foods where I could um, and cared nothing about nothing more than their emotional security Mm. Um, and therefore we choose things that are in alignment with what we believe in and therefore we have to almost sometimes make the other bad to yeah. justify. So yeah. say we're exhausted, right? And we've been co-sleeping as I did for years. I had to say that sleep training was bad because it has to be worth it. Like I have to be doing this mm. for a reason, right? Yeah. So we have to kind of hate or distance ourselves from the other. But the truth is that there in, there doesn't need to be these two sides. Mm. And we're very much here to build that bridge. But you're so right. It is sleep and feeding. Yeah. I think if yeah. either like those are included as a topic on the Happy Mum, Happy Baby community yeah. even, which is, you know, meant to be judgment free. Right. There are people who really feel like they have to get their point across and kind yeah. of have to... Um, have to validate why they did what they did yeah. and why that's the right way right. of doing it. Yeah. And I get it because when I was exhausted, I was actually really against sleep training. Wow. So really? my story is that I was a super responsive, on-demand parent, as I still am, by what the way. What were you saying about barefoot? Why was I, the barefoot I'm, just, I'm just a bit of a hippie. Oh, okay. All of my choices <laughs> seem to align with that le- that side of things. Yeah. Like, I chose to leave the cord pumping. I chose to do the drops, not the vaccine. So I'm that kind yeah. of, if you could have a profile of parenting, that's, that's me. And I thought that sleep training training because I followed a few accounts and read a few books that had had basically told me very clearly in no uncertain terms that it was barbaric and it was neglectful and we shouldn't be parents if we um, didn't want to wake up in the night and our children's needs don't stop when it falls dark and I was fully on board with that Mm. Um, I didn't realise at the time that actually what was the toxin wasn't sleep teaching or training, it was the sleep deprivation because the greatest most paradoxical thing for me as a parent then, and I know that this is mainstream thought, is that the very reason that I avoided sleep training was to be a patient, calm, responsive, creative, playful, attached parent. And guess what the exhaustion ended up with me being? Hostile, emotionally volatile, snappy. And I've got heads to goosebumps when I say this because I Mm. feel it deep in my bones Mm. because the very reason I avoided sleep teaching was to be something that I wasn't because Mm. I was so tired. 
Mm. And if I just got some sleep, I could have been the parent I wanted to be. But I didn't know that until I got to the other side. And I only got to the other side through absolutely not my own choice. I had a car crash with my 10-month-old baby in it because I was so Mm. exhausted. And we now know through our training and our paediatric sleep consultancy stuff that we are as impaired as if we were drunk and on drugs when we are Mm. having less than five hours sleep regularly. We are not safe. And that's why I was leaving the tap running in the paddling pool and not knowing my kid was there. And that's why I wasn't seeing the cars that were coming out. And when that happened, I literally, in that moment, it hit me Mm. that A, I wasn't safe as a parent. B, my child wasn't safe. C, really, is this how it's supposed to be, dragging myself through the days only to dread the nights, to do it all over again? And, and really, is that how it's supposed to be? And and these are the golden years. Aren't I supposed to be enjoying them if they're so fleeting? And did you instantly, instantly think to yourself, it's the sleep? Instantly. Really? I knew it. And I realised then after doing it instantly, when I had that crash, I said... I have to get sleep sound. I remember mum moved in, didn't she, at that point? We were so worried about you. (sighs) Were you? Yeah, Yeah. as as, as a sister, did you recognise that I didn't have children then. I was living in London nursing and I just remember that the contact was less and we're so close, aren't we? And you just... So close. I I always describe it as it was like she was switched off at the mains Mm. and that's how it felt that you were. And I remember mum moving in and then that was the start of change, wasn't it? And better rest for you when you look at the symptoms of depression and Mm. exhaustion you we've got we put it in our book you can tick the ticks are Mm. unbelievably parallel Mm. we know that depression maternal depression um it impacts upon children so much and we know that exhaustion impacts so much upon depression and one of the studies that absolutely blows my mind every time i say Mm. it and it's i've been saying it for 10 years is looking at a group of 738 women in Australia, mothers, and they were tested clinically for postnatal depression. Mm. And 70% of the test group were officially depressed clinically. And after sleep intervention, just 10% of the same Mm. group were tested as Mm. maternally, were clinically measured as being depressed. In other words, if we were to apply these figures to UK maternal depression, around 82,000 women a year need not suffer Mm. with Mm. depression if they were just to get the sleep that they need. I mean, the amount of times, I can remember with my first, Buzz would, um, you know, he'd settle himself, he'd go to sleep, it was all lovely. Then we took him to Australia for three weeks and when we were there, because of the time difference, I was like, I'm going to pat your bum, I'm going to sway you and I'm going to help you go to sleep because we're in a hotel room and you won't go to sleep if we're in the hotel room. We got back home after three weeks and when we left him, he was like, what are you doing? Yeah. I want you here. Yeah. And I don't only just want you here. I yeah. want you to hold my hand while I fall asleep. Yeah, like, of course. Like, what's going on? Yeah. And then, you know, you try and kind of go, no, you self do this. Yeah. Right, and leave, yeah. leave. Oh, my gosh, I've never heard crying oh, no. like it. There yeah. was no way that, no. like, we had obviously changed things for him and we had to address that in yeah, some way yeah, of course and that was there was a lot a lot of lot of hand holding yeah. and of course there was you know yeah and that's okay though there is no such thing as a sleep problem mm. until it's a problem for you yeah. that's what someone said so yeah. i was saying to you earlier about one of our kids now being in our bed yeah. there's a slightly older child suddenly getting in and someone said to me but is do you mind yeah that's like, it. No, I don't. Yeah, yes. I, I feel like he's telling us that he needs yeah, something right. and I'm he listening is. to him. Absolutely. Yes. And that is, I talk about a mother compass in yeah. the book and how that your intuition, if it is feeling right, and yeah. it's, then it, it is. So talk to me about Carmen Bright. Obviously, after your, your crash, which thankfully neither of you were hurt, but I imagine it really shook you up. Yeah. After that, how did you start changing things? So I knew that what I didn't want to do was the whole cry it out where you leave them to it, right? Right. Now, I'm not judging upon that. I have a friend who did it with her sons. I know them. They're 16 and 18 and they're the most delightful, open-hearted boys (laughs) you could hope to meet. So no judgment. But for me, it wasn't for me and I didn't want to do it. And we don't practice that. Um, But I did know that what I was doing wasn't working. And my favourite phrase is nothing changes if nothing changes. So Mm. I knew I had to change something. So for me personally, Personally, my 10-month-old was feeding every 45 minutes to two hours, night and day. And her lovely, gorgeous Michelin rolls told me that she definitely (laughs) did not need it. Um, And I think the fact that she was 10-month-old really helped because I knew, and I'd looked up on the NHS website and said from six months, they don't necessarily need a night bleed. And I knew she didn't need 10. (laughs) Um, So I thought I can at least take off one. So what I did, G, is I went, right, I'm not ready to do none. 
Uh, or rather, I am, but she's not, I thought. Yeah. So I thought what I can do is go, if she wakes within three hours, because that's a newborn kind of regularity yeah. of feeding, isn't it? I know it's not food, so I'm going to give comfort in another way. So for me personally, it was going in, it was touch. Sometimes it was picking her up. Um, and of course, there was protest when that was yeah. going on. Mm. My mum moved in because she knew that I wouldn't have stood 20 seconds of that. And when I was in the sitting room with her, do you know, I remember, and, and bearing in mind, just for context, our mum is about as, she's a, a social worker, or she was, and about as soft as they come, right? So just to give you context. <laughs> Context. Probably not the best person in hindsight, but actually, because it wasn't her baby. There's a different emotional, physical yes. connection, isn't there? And she had it in, again, a bit more context, had laid with us, stroked our hair, held yeah. our hand till we were six plus. We didn't want to go on school trips at times. So we were the ones that really needed our parents yeah. to sleep. So mum has that background of what perhaps didn't work so well for her overall, maybe. So... The big thing, and this is why I knew that it was the support, not the method, that was yeah. the magic, right? Because while I was on the sofa, I remember her sat next to me and me going, I've got to go in. And it had been about three seconds. You know, <laughs> She needs me. The classic, you know, in your gut, you know, pulling your guts out, pulling yeah, your heart yeah. out. And she went, darling, if you just listen for a little tiny bit, you'll hear that what she's doing is, you come back here right now. <laughs> this protest, is not yeah. what we agreed. <laughs> it's not... Where are you? Yeah. I need you. And I said, but I'm hearing where are you? And she said, listen closer. And I went, you're right, she's cross. And she went, yes, she is. And, and I was OK with cross. Right. I wasn't OK with, you know, I'm yeah. alone. Where are you? And so I set it out for a little bit. And I think, I think it was about 40 minutes of up and down, a bit of settling. And every time she went down, mum went, listen, that's her doing what you're asking her to do. She's okay. Mm. And I was going in every two, three minutes, like nothing at all, really, in the grand yeah. scheme of things. Night one, she slept for six hours straight the first night and then another couple of three-hour chunks. Night two, she did 10 hours. Night three, she did 12 hours. And she is now 16, almost. She has had less than five broken nights, mm. including being ill since that day. Mm. And she is the most confident, kind, good self-confident person with the most compassion you could ever hope to meet and after that day I literally it was three days done wasn't it yeah. and I felt like a brand new person really my spark came back behind my eyes my immunity over time completely changed I was always getting something I, I don't now typically get ill we know yeah. that sleep and immunity is really linked and I took my number to the health visitors and said whatever you do give my number please if there are any mums that are absolutely on their knees please give it to them I'll help them I'll do whatever I can and I volunteered like that for five years so that's how it started you got a bit of a rep reputation actually didn't you Eve was known as the village crazy lady well I called you the I village crazy, crazy lady <laughs> but you would literally you went on to have well, Finn well some things were so straight could be the worse. well there is that worse. There is, you it went on there. to have Finn quite you know there's quite a small gap between mm. Eve's first and second and even then you were still volunteering and I remember you going to people's houses helping them and then coming back breastfeeding Finn and going to bed I knew that healthy babies above the age of six to eight months or whatever were capable of doing mm. really well at night with perhaps a night feed if you wanted to or a couple. And so I knew that if I gave him the opportunity to do it, he was perfectly capable. It was me that was in doing the, the, the ings, as we call them, the feeding, the staying, the patting, the rocking, which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with. They're wonderful, beautiful things that are essential in the first six months and yeah. beyond sometimes. I knew that if I just said, you're all right, buddy, you've got this, and, and, and did what you did naturally with your first, yeah. which, by the way, is amazing. I did not. Um, I knew that he would be, all right, mum, I've got mm. this. You know, and he did, and so did the next one, and so did the yeah, next yeah, one. Yeah. And then after five years of 100% success rate, and one of them was twins, and I think the dad, Mark, I'll never forget him, he said to me, I'd have paid you a £1,000 to do that. And I went, I don't want any money. I'm not doing it for the money. He said, OK, well, forget the money. Do you love helping people? And I went, I do. And he said, then take it to the world. And I thought, <laughs> I can't do that. What do I know? I'm not qualified. And that's when I went on to qualify. And then I had the confidence to do it. But not until I'd qualified, interestingly, even though I had 100 families under my really? belt. Really? Didn't yeah. have the confidence at all because I wasn't trained And when first. you were training, did you like? do you feel like you still took on things that surprised you? Honestly, I promise you that 90% of what I do, I didn't learn on the course. Really? Mm.
And it's completely different because whilst typical sleep training approaches would be like, right, the room temperature, this is the, you want all the practical surface stuff. Yeah. You know, in the nap, you know, the, the wake windows and this must be at this time, which we don't prescribe to at all. We, we're very much baby led. So yeah. if your baby's knackered after an hour, but their nap gap is two hours, put them to bloody sleep. You know, yeah. it's fine. Um, but in terms of the rigidity of it, we, we weren't down for that at all. So we just went for well, let's do do it as and when and let's, if they're tired, let's put them down. And we don't, mm. we just don't go along mm. like that, do we? No. We're not for that at and all. And I'm very much a routine person. I'm a typical nurse. Like, I like things just so. Yeah, so I guess, yeah. well, how are things different with you when your yeah. little ones come along? Because it's also worth telling the listeners mm. that you've got four children each. Yeah, we have and four children are, each. You, yeah. you two are of four. Yeah. Your mum had four. Yeah. So it's, it's busy households. Yeah, busy, busy. And I remember... I, I came on board when Louis was born, my second yes. son, and I remember you ringing me and I was in London nursing. I remember you saying, Gem, I've got like 10 families I need help with. And I was like, darling, I love what you're doing. I'm so proud of you, but I'm practicing in London. I love my job as a nurse. And you said, I'm Please. saving lives, you said. Yeah, that's it. I, I'm saving lives because I was working in acute medicine. I was really enjoying my practice. I, I wanted to be a nurse from like the age of about six. Yeah. And I said, I love what you're doing, but no, thank you. And, and yeah. you said, Please, Gem, just this one family. And I remember supporting them and having a break. So I still remember their names. It was 10 years ago. And then I remember ringing you in tears and saying, oh, my gosh, we are actually saving lives <laughs> in this work. We are. And thanking you and like, please let me come on board. And that was 10 years ago. And that, that's it. And it, we're interested in how was your journey to birth? Yeah. To mm. conception. Did you... Did you did you have any difficulties with your parent your parents your parents maternal paternal um, relationships as a child like yeah, how yeah. do you feel about protests and upset what does it do to you when you hear yeah. crying because so it's, it's often not about sleep at all is it no it's more than that yeah. it really is like for example it's it's typical that if you've had a really difficult time getting your baby earth yeah. side for example Gemma's experienced a great deal of baby loss yeah. herself I'm very fortunate that I haven't. Mm then why on earth would you want to have any kind yeah. of suffering or upset yeah. when they're here? You've, yeah. you've wanted them for so yeah. long. So that's all relevant stuff yeah. that we're interested and in, we look into. Um, so it's, it's just so different for each person. And going back to my children, I just had you as my teacher and I'd seen what you'd done and Toby slept very well. I think a little bit of me was quite smug because I was like, it's because I'm a children's nurse. And then I had Louis. <laughs> wow. So that's a, that, and that is important and, to know, isn't yes. it? To, the, the difference, difference. Yeah. and I, I remember this is so funny I remember calling the paediatric ward where one of my best friends is a consultant and saying to him he doesn't sleep like what's going on and this was on week three or four and he had to remind me <laughs> yes love that that's really normal you're okay because he had reflux he had a really difficult birth we were osteopaths like getting everything going and he just didn't sleep for a whole year yeah and that was him yeah. you know that was him and that yes. was really difficult but it it really helped me in supporting families knowing that it's just not linear you know there's yes. there's so much to it and and going back to the baby loss like I've experienced baby loss four times and Posey was one of a twin and I I had to co-sleep with her because there were so many times when we didn't know that she was going to be okay right we nearly lost her about 13 or 14 times I got offered to have a termination at week 20 because I was so sick and so I needed to be close to her just to check that she was real yeah and to and so we I talk about baby loss a lot on the page and so many people come to me and they say so how did you do it and I said just at your pace just like with anything with parenting it's got to be at your pace it's just so important isn't it yeah there are no shoulds none mm. No sheds. Absolutely. Um, so if someone comes to you, we, you literally start with all the the stuff around mm. it mm. first. Yeah. And then, then what happens? So let's say that we get someone coming in. Let's say she's got a, I don't know, what's the most common, 12 months maybe? Yeah. 12 month old baby. Let's say that typically the, the ing, the most common ing is feeding, as you can imagine, yeah. be it bottle or breast, but typically breastfeeding. And I we both breastfed up to our heart's content. Um Feeding and they they won't my baby won't go to sleep without and then you can fill in the gaps rocking yeah, feeding yeah. patting I mean we all know people will be going yes of course <laughs> and the really simple and I think quite freeing thing to know both to give you permission to sleep teach and not to is that every single sleep issue night and day is going to be down other than the physical of course right if they've got eczema or digestive issues that's yeah. that but apart from that. 
the way in which a baby or child goes to sleep or back to sleep is the way in which they will come to believe they need, just like you said when yeah. you introduced the rocking. Now, there's nothing wrong with staying with your child and holding their hand, breastfeeding to sleep. They're, they're magical, wonderful things to do that both of us have loved doing. However, if for you, when you're putting your baby down, they are then, of course, waking up and going, where's that breast? Where's that bottle? Mm. Where's that jig? Where's that rock? Where's that pram? Um, that's fine again. But if you want them to take the sleep, they're capable of, of taking and arguably need to feel their best selves. And, you know, the impact upon sleep is is profound upon our bodies and brains then the the way in which that often needs to happen not always some babies can be rocked to sleep and then sleep for 12 hours but it's very yeah. much in the minority um then if you want them to take those 11 to 12 hours that they're capable of sleeping from six to eight months um the way is that they fall asleep not on their own of course but they fall asleep safe and warm and in the knowledge that they're loved and you give them the opportunity to do it themselves with your support and love so that when they come into light sleep which we're all mm. programmed to do yeah. to see if there's a bear in the cave or a snake on the rock as of days of old we're supposed to come into light sleep they go oh yeah this is like exactly the vibe that I was in when I fell asleep I'm yeah. cool then they go back to sleep yeah you've posted something about this is it stirring sleep stirring stir to sleep stir to sleep what is this yes it's I've actual never heard magic. of this it is it actual is magic, magic. So, it's not ours by the way yeah. I just want to say we, yeah. we learned about it on our OCN course which is the sleep accreditation but basically if a baby is waking up at the same time each night or in indeed an early wake you stir them in their sleep and what that does is it tricks their body clock into going into a deeper phase of sleep so you're bringing them into light sleep artificially if you like yeah. and it can reset the whole night and that's only for habitual wakes but let's mm. say lots of people have habitual wakes yeah. so let's say 11 o'clock right yep. that means that they're in light sleep at 11 o'clock whatever time it is they're in light sleep because they're waking mm. up so if we go in like 25 30 minutes before and we do something that we're not waking them it's not called wake to sleep it's yeah, important yeah, people yeah. remember that because then you're in a whole world of hurt yeah. but <laughs> if i just some... wake you up in the middle <laughs> yeah. of the night i want more sleep so i'm going to wake you up um if they stir them by, and for some babies it's literally you open the door and they've stirred, mm. um, but it might be that you literally need to do this, and then you know, and I'm stroking Gem's cheek, then th then that's enough. But all we're doing is we know we've done this successfully when their body physically acknowledges it, so they might roll over or rub their <laughs> yeah. nose or sigh or and when we've done that what we're doing is we're taking them straight out of that cycle and tricking them into the next mm. one so that when 11 o'clock comes they're not in light sleep yeah yeah it's it's a a it is magic it is good but it's different to wakes yeah. that are there because there's an incentive yeah. like yeah. a feed or rock which is lovely but it might not be going hand in hand with the best possible sleep that they can have. One thing that makes my sleep better is organisation. Mm. So same. knowing that those bags are packed, yeah. their school uniforms are out. That's a good point. That I'm just same. makes me go, that it takes yeah. out some of the pressures of the morning. Are you naturally like that? Or do you, have you oh, had I've to always learn done it. Have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've always good. done it. But I used to go to school in London. Yeah. So I used to be up really yeah. early. Right. So I used to be yeah. up at six. Yeah. My uniform was there in the really? order that I put it on. Yeah. yeah. That's all. You two, I'm going to rub both of you. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't. Yeah, but then Tom doesn't do that. Okay, cool. And he still manages to get out the yeah, door on oh, time. Do. And that's, yeah, that's the trouble is I can out. get four kids out the door with packed lunches, uniforms, PE kits, um, <laughs> cooking ingredients in 25 minutes. <laughs> But I'm going to die of a heart attack at about 45. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. But the trouble is because I pull it off. I think yeah. I've got this. Well, I yeah. haven't. It's always like a test to yourself. Done it again in yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah, but your heart rate oh, during yeah. that 25 minutes. I mean, luckily I don't have a fancy watch because if I did, it yeah. would be it going would be off. Beefing. <laughs> Go to the hospital. Go yes. to the hospital. <laughs> Bitch blockers now. Oh, yeah. Right, I Sorry. asked you yes. to bring in your three most asked questions. So that's what we do in Parenting SOS. You bring yes. in your most Three asked questions. Yes. Gemma's like, oh, yes, I remember this part of it. <laughs> right. Uh, so, your number one most asked question is, why won't my baby sleep? Yes. I know I've asked that question many a times. It's so hard, but the truth is, what we touched on earlier in a sentence is that. Obviously, pre six months, they're not meant to sleep. Yes. So I've got a gorgeous best friend at the moment who has literally a 12 week old baby, and she's like, they're not sleeping. I'm like, I know. Yeah. And they're not going to sleep. Yeah. They're not quite. programmed to, are Because they? their tummies are small. They haven't had the melatonin that, yeah. that comes in. Um, and there's all sorts of other reasons. So so pre six months, they're not going to, and that's okay. And, yeah. and there's no such thing as bad habits, right? So we can feed rock mm. contact where to our heart's content or or discontent because it's really 
bloody awful sometimes. But so that's normal. But as to beyond six months, and that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Why doesn't my baby sleep? Um, Yes, there might be some physical things going on. You know, we deal with lots of babies that have dairy intolerances mm. or allergies. Eczema, we've helped babies in, um, you know, those boots that you all know what oh. they're called, Jen. Yeah, lots of children. Um, lots harnesses, of you know, the public yeah. harnesses. And mm. they've all had sleep improved. We've also helped, on, on that note, children who have been orphaned, children who have lost, mm. like, mm. really deep yeah. stuff. So it can, there can, can be help. But the answer is... Typically, usually, um, the way in which they fall asleep is that the parent is doing sleep for them. So they're taking them over the finish line to sleep, which there's nothing wrong with, but they're doing sleep for them so that they're not able to do it themselves, but only at the moment. So Mm. as long as we give them the message through our actions that you need me to do this. We're not trying to say that, by the way. We're inadvertently Mm. saying we hold hands to go to sleep or you're in my bed from 1am to go to sleep, which is fine. They are learning and you are learning as the parent that this is the only way we can do it. And that's why um, when they come into light sleep, like I said to you, they're like, well, where's mum's bed and where's this? Because not because it's all they can do, but it's all they know. Yeah. 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 It's like you said, certain things, it's only a problem when it becomes a problem. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah. And and knowing that you don't have to choose between a well-attached baby and a baby who sleeps because there is a way to do it yeah. that is really, really responsive if you're ready to make changes. You yeah. don't have to struggle on if it's really difficult. There's other ways to but do yeah, it. But yeah, if you're getting sleep with them in your yeah. bed like you are, yeah. happy days. Brilliant. Like you're getting a cuddle, they're rested. Yeah. And, but, but you might have two families in exactly the same situation and one might say, we get sleep, they're only young once. I'm loving it. I wake up not rested, but I'm all right. I can mm. get through. I, I'm able to do my job. I'm able to be a mum. And the other one with exactly the same amount of mm. disturbances through the invariable kicking and elbows and nostrils and stuff might say, I feel I feel separate to my husband. Yeah, I'm yeah. snapping at my kids. Yeah. I don't feel I can go back to work. So that's the person mm. that might want to think about sleep yeah. teaching, not this person. Yeah. Yet they have exactly the same mm. setup, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, next question is, will sleep training damage our bond? Oh, this is such a huge thing. And the reason why I didn't sleep train and why I had this little car crash, which was minor. And it was that my sole purpose on this planet is to create babies that are emotionally secure and safe. Nothing else, really, other than, the you know, the mandatory feeding and stuff. <laughs> and this is the opposite of that in my head before yeah. I did it. Um what I now know, 15,000 families later, 15 years later, a book later, and just the joyful vocation that is freeing families from exhaustion, I now know that sleep and sleep teaching separately and together are attachment enhancing mm, yeah. because we cannot be the parents we want to be unless we're rested. And I'm not rested lots of the time and I see the difference. But also, I think there's a really strong argument that if we want to be need meeting parents, I mean, who doesn't, right? Yeah. Um, how can we not include sleep in the equation? Mm. Because in you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs where we, we see that you can't get to self-actualization and dr- be dreaming big and being your best self, if you haven't got the mm. absolute basics and sleep is the bottom, mm. it's like the, the the foundation. So I think that actually not only will our babies feel more chilled, they'll make friends easier at school, they'll learn better, they'll be able to separate from you better when you do need to go to work or they need to go to mm. nursery or school. Not only will they have that and better immunity and feel great about themselves and perceive the world in a different way, but also you will be able to be the parent that you dreamed of. Like I so often go, hey, let's um, make a fort out of a cardboard box. I'm not going to do that when I'm Mm. shattered or I might, but I might do it really begrudgingly and be like, why did I start this sort of thing? So the the answer to the question, will it harm my attachment with my with my baby, is it's going to enhance it beyond your wildest Mm. dreams. But it's so important to talk about crying because it's, it's important and the yeah. reason yes. it's important is because it's the main obstacle right. to not doing teaching because as mothers we're programmed to rush in to rescue yeah. it can feel really counterintuitive not to do that so it's really important to say that with responsive teaching even with the most responsive teaching there is going to be crying yeah 
through our actions and through our method, we're visiting constantly. So we are reassuring our babies and we're or saying... in the room, if that's the or method in the room, you choose. And we're saying, my darling, I love you, you're safe, I'm here, I'm always going to come back, but I'm going to teach us how to do this a different way because what we're doing isn't working. What we're doing is, is, is brutal at the moment. Yeah. So the crying happens, but what our families tell us is they felt that they were in the room so much and they noticed such a quick reduction in the level of protest in the time it took for their babies to go to sleep that they're noticing that straight away. Crying is a part and parcel of life. Yeah. We don't not give them vaccinations. Yeah. And, and, you know, how is it that when you're doing sleep training, the crying is, is damaging their brains, mm. but when they're crying because they can't have the lolly that you really need to not give them because it's not great mm. and you're just about to have dinner, why doesn't that damage their brain? Mm. So there's yeah. a lot of, I think the biggest thing I would say is there's so much misconceptions. Mm. We call them the wild untruths, like mm. that the, the shame parents, and, and not intentionally perhaps, but parents end up feeling very ashamed for even considering mm. the dirty word that is sleep mm. training. Well, your final question of the three mm. uh, was, do your plans include crying? It's a yes and a no. Yeah. So there is no crying in our plans. We don't go, put your baby in their cot, let them cry, and then go in every this, that and the other. What we say is, we're going to stop doing the thing that isn't working for you and your baby. Yeah. Um, and when you do that, there is probably going to be in response to making changes to behaviours and patterns that aren't working for your family at all. That's why yeah. you reached out. In response to that, there's going to be some protests and upset. Mm. So are they part of the plans? Does it do the teaching, the crying? Absolutely no. not. Will crying happen when I make changes to sleep? Almost certainly. So it's a yes and a no. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good way to describe it. So our nap gap, our weight windows are much shorter than most people's because it works. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. That's um, so at four weeks, they don't really want to be awake any longer than 45 minutes right? And that means that in that time, that's the nappy and the feed. So basically they want to sleep, right? And then every month thereafter, so two months, it's an hour, so it's 15 minutes more, so it's an hour. Yeah. And from the age of, of one month to 12 months, you just add on 15 minutes, minutes. per month. That's it. Yeah. And if you follow those, those nap gaps, right? Yeah. So for six months, it would be two hours. For seven months, two and a quarter. For eight months, two and a half, right? Yeah. If you follow those wake windows of ours, which we give out for free because it's so transformative in yeah, itself. Really. And and you feed right before. Obviously, if they're reflexy, you need to keep them up right a bit afterwards. But let's say they're not. Um, and you allow them to go down, drowsy bit awake, and you give them a bit of help. And if it doesn't work after 15 minutes, get them up and yeah. try again later. Or have have a pram nap or have a yeah. have a contact nap. Nap gaps are, yeah, huge. Everything. I mean, it's mm. almost worth having a fourth four. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know where we are. You know we won't tell you not to. <laughs> But everyone told me that three was the magic number, but it's been four chaos. Is, three is mental. Four evens it out a bit, I this think. Is, we were talking about this to somebody yeah. yesterday, weirdly. Um, and four is hard, right? Okay, yeah. you, I, I have the, the wrinkles to show it. But if, when someone asks you, are you done? When you're done, you go, I'm done. I'm like, done. you're sure. Yeah, yeah, if 100%. You go, I think so. <laughs> I'm not sure you're done, but don't blame me because yeah. I'm not getting an invoice for the nappies or anything. I'm staying out of this. I should have shut my mouth. That's two of my life. I quite like even numbers, so I'm a four girl. That's the only reason See, I have I my... I do like even numbers. It's crazy. Right, we okay. ask um, the Happy Mum, Happy Baby uh, community for some questions. Right. So we've got a few. Uh, so one says, how do we shift from one to two babies and them sharing a room? So staggered bedtimes, basically. Really? So I say to start together and then stagger. So doing a bath together is really lovely. Yeah. It's really nice for bonding. And then pyjamas, even a story together. But if you've got a newborn baby, just do the bath, pop them in a sling, you know, you can do bedtime that way. And I think it's good to keep it quite chilled yeah. because it might be that, you know, your older child might want a slightly later night or, you know, if baby's there, that's a big change and they might want to be involved in that a bit more. Mm -hmm. So it's just like going through the throw and kind of, I say, walking through it. So it will change, you yeah. know, all the time. And we also say that the older child can really enjoy the fact that they have to be quiet because they're up later. Yeah. So they've got the kudos. Yeah, so yeah. you said that, um, was it Louis used to really, because Louis and Kit share... Yeah. Um, and he, he used to really enjoy being like, I'll oh, be quiet for Kit, Mum. Like, yeah. as in, I've got this, you know. So they quite yeah. like being in on the conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. And just staggering um, bed by half an hour can make such a difference. So yeah. Kit goes to bed half an hour before Louis, and Louis will go up and he'll give him a kiss on the cheek. And, and they have to bed. be quiet because the, yeah. the other one's asleep, which they actually do, weirdly. Yeah. They do comply. And does it mean, uh, doing that, I imagine it means that you get that little bit of bonding time with each child. Yeah, so they all get definitely. their moment with you. Yeah, just that little bit of time. Yeah. Mm. I mean, 
I like this a lot. It's funny, isn't it? I think when you have one, so much thought goes into what that is going to look like. And then the second comes along, you're like, yeah. how do I, yeah. how am I going to manage what this? this? Look, yeah, what's yeah. this? Yeah, it's really tricky. I remember thinking, the other thing, I don't know if this is normal or not, I'm sure it must be, but I had genuine heartache that how would I love... Did you get yeah. this? Oh, when you were pregnant with And second. would it take away from the pot of Tilly, who yeah, was my yeah. firstborn, um, ha- would it take m- away from her... And um, of course, mm. it doesn't. We have mm. in we have unlimited pots. Yeah, it seems yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if anything, it grows. Yeah, so seeing that your oh, first yes. child love your second yes. child, just you go, oh my god, I love you even yeah. more now. Yeah, how so is that true. possible? It just I, grows. I thought I loved you to the max. And what a gift you're giving them. Yeah, a sibling. I've always found that my kids actually sleep really well when they're sharing a room. Yes. And something I thought it would always be awful. Like uh, my middle child has really bad. We well, used to have really bad night terrors. He yes. used to wake up screaming oh, no. inside such you know in such hysterics really hysteria oh. and but he would literally snap out of it and it would be like nothing had happened yeah um but he would never wake his brother up ever yeah. really yeah. That's ever amazing. yeah yeah They've, that's one of the biggest concerns is i can't do sleep training because yeah. i'm gonna wait but honestly i reckon i've I don't know if I've had a sibling disturbed yeah. in the whole time, which is yeah. weird, because yeah. they almost should be. Yeah. But it's weird, they don't. I and think they we... just get used to each other's noises. They do, and that's they, true. It's almost and like a white no- natural a white, white noise. noise. Yeah. Um, and we always say that, by the way, if you if you are room sharing, either get one of the big ones, if they're a good sleeper, get them out in your room camping on the floor for a bit and do it, yeah. or have them in there, but tell them, like communicate, you know, we're going to be doing this, but they're going to be okay and I'm going to be there with them. It's not, you know, it's okay. But also to pop white noise on in the mm. same room just completely... Mm, sorts yeah. that out so but mm. we, we don't really get disturbances no. but that is one of the main objections yeah. alongside the crying yeah. it's I don't want to disturb my husband who gets up early for night shifts or, mm-hmm. or whatever not night shifts but you know yeah. gets up early so all the siblings that's a big one yeah. mm. but it's not a thing yeah it's no. not a problem mm. really uh, actually our, our three had to share a room for a year only a couple of years ago. Really? Yeah. That time, very lovely. Yeah. Really? They well, enjoy it, don't they? Room to room to yeah. room. Everyone's just together. Yeah, and they're yes. together and they'll have memories of that, which is yeah. so lovely. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, next question. I often nurse to sleep. Any tips for when the time comes to stop? So keep nursing if you want to nurse, but just separate feeding a slightly little bit from sleep. Like a second. You're yeah. doing a lovely feed and then you know, enabling self-settling in the most responsive way. And again, when you were talking about feeding, we don't, you know, you can keep as many night feeds in as you want to. Um, It's not a condition of our teaching that you have to wean night feeds. So you might want to keep one in until 12 months or 18 months, or even some of our families do it up to two, just one feed. Um, But you can drop it at your pace. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to really responsibly enable self-settling. So you're not feeding for every wake, just the ones that you choose to. And then babies naturally wean themselves when you do that. Mm. Is it, yeah, I can remember when I started winning through the night, mm. I, rem- I, I I suddenly realised as well that every time they cried in the night, it was a feed. Yeah. yeah. So actually kind of going, well, what will happen this time if I go in and just give them a cuddle? Yeah. You know, just yeah, kind of exactly. seeing. So you got curious almost. Yeah. 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 And did it, what, what yeah, it happened? Did, yeah. It worked. They just, yeah, yeah. They just wanted amazing. a cuddle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, someone has said is sleep training possible for babies with issues like colic or reflux over to the nurse it's definitely possible Um, it's really important to acknowledge that if you have a difficult start and that might be a traumatic labour it might be a journey to conception or it might be that your baby has reflux and pain their sleep will be harder to sort out because they they will be on high alert if they're uncomfortable or they're in pain or their feeding needs are different. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still you can still get good rest. So there are ways to work around that. Um, I'm a huge advocate of natural remedies and things that can help. So with eczema and reflux, you know, inflammation starts in the gut. So giving a really good non-dairy probiotic can help hugely. Just know that there is hope when you're in that phase and your yeah. baby has reflux. It is impossible. Mm. It's so difficult. And it adds a whole of the dynamic so go gently know that this is not forever and when those symptoms are managed we can absolutely get the rest that you need if you want it there's there's mm. an end yeah you know? i mm. think that's i think the hope is so important yeah, it really because is. i think it's, it's feeling like it's never ending yeah and this is your life now yeah it is i think that's the... and that's what your reality is telling you yeah. you know it when you're in it, it yeah. it's very much feels permanent but it isn't and that you're the only one going through it. Mm. I can remember going to a um, like a baby yoga thing when uh, with with my first, mm. and uh, I can remember 
I don't know why they did it, but every the start of every session, you'd go around the circle and talk about how much the, the kids had slept. Wow. Uh, but one mum hysterically went, he slept for 45 minutes last oh. night. But it was a laugh. <laughs> but you could yeah. see the pain <laughs> yeah. behind Agony. it. Yeah. yeah. And I just remember going, oh, my God. like Yeah. That's not sustainable. No. Brutal. But I did actually see that mum on a walk years later. Did and you? I told her that I thought about her often. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. She was like, yeah, thankfully that, that stopped. That's okay. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, oh, I remember having a mum that um, I'll never forget her, ever. And she literally is in my heart all the time. She's there all the time. And she phoned me up right in the early days. I think it would have been a good seven years ago. Yeah. Um, so very early days. And she phoned me up. And again, I've got goosebumps. And she said, I am can't... This is the first thing she said, she didn't say hi, I'm inquiring about sleep. Because it was true to me at the time, of course. Yeah. It was just one, one man show. And she said, I can't walk up these stairs again. I'm going to I'm going to jump down these stairs with my baby. My baby's in my arms. He's in my arms. And I knew, I want to jump down the stairs now because I can't walk up these stairs again because I'm too tired and I can't do it anymore. Oh. And I thought, shit, I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I, I'm out of my depth here. But I also thought, I'm the person on the other end of the phone here. Yeah. So I thought, I've got to do what I can. So we spoke and I said, we're going to... I said, let's go up. So, so anyway, she, she of course, went and walked in. She was staying with her mum in what was the mum's... You know, like the room that's not the room sort of thing, the tiny, yeah. tiny box room, with um, her baby who was, at the time, eight months old. He's now eight or whatever. Um, she didn't have a job. She couldn't work. She was... Absolutely dead on her feet like she was done and she was I wouldn't I I, would, I don't like to say suicidal but she was absolutely mm. considering that because they say about suicide they say it's not nobody ever wants to die they don't want to keep on feeling the way they're feeling mm -hmm. now um, and that's all it is and we've stayed in touch and she contributed to the book and everything and she is now going out to raves the child is eight years old he's doing brilliantly at school they say he's like a genius <laughs> she's got her own house she's got her own job and she is she attributes the whole thing to getting that sleep and that I'll never forget her yeah and amazing. that's why we do what we do and also mm. being that person that is there I think mm. you know one of the things it's a statistic, a statistic that I talk about a lot the leading cause of death in new mums is suicide mm. and how much of that is linked to sleep if we're oh. saying that depression is linked yeah. to sleep you know so much that and I think so many women need a person there to yeah. just go I've got you yeah the key here is the support and when I say support I don't actually necessarily mean the one-to-one -one which we offer where we you know we have them in they have us in their pocket on the whatsapp and we do the voice notes and they listen to us talking we say oh do you know what hold off a bit longer that's okay and we give all the the and oh my goodness and we celebrate with them you did 45 minutes in a row as in a stretch rather than 10 and all of that but the key is the compassion that mm, is yeah. the difference mm. is is we are genuinely care yeah. and I feel like we're bringing families back together through the power of rest and I think Shakespeare called it nature's soft nurse mm. sleep is just lush and mm. it is I mean I feel like I would quite like you to leave me voice notes on my WhatsApp I mean <laughs> just I'm down for that yeah, I, I do I do a like... range of accents if you're interested well. <laughs> oh I love an accent yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, final question from the Had Mum Had Baby community is how do I get my three and five year old to sleep in their own bed? Right. I cuddle them to sleep every night. So this is obviously someone who, this is the situation, yes. she's not happy with yes. it. Yes, you basically start outside of the bedroom. Our main advice with toddler sleep is it's normal for toddlers to need extra support because their worlds are growing and expanding and they're forming different relationships. They're exerting their autonomy, which we want. So starting out of the bedroom is where we start. We have something in our plans which is so simple. Can I share this? Sis? Share whatever you want. Um, it's called Golden Time. And it's literally 10 minutes a day where you don't have your phone with you. Mm -hmm. It is led by them. And you're giving them that one-to-one -one time, connecting with them so that when it's bedtime, you're saying, oh, darling, I love that time today. Can we do it? again tomorrow if you have some good sleep tonight we can do that you know it's not about a reward or a big fancy thing it's time yeah um throughout the routine it doesn't have to be a long bedtime routine you're saying so you've you've 
you've done your teeth. We've chosen one story because that's what we're going to have. Um, we've had our golden time today. We've had a cuddle. I love you. Here's your water so you don't need a drink. Here's your blanket so you won't be cold. <laughs> that is negating demands. Yeah. And you've had a wee so you don't need one. I love you. <laughs> and I'll see you in the morning, you know? <laughs> yeah, that is. And the worst thing you can say when you do the um, cot to bed migration is um, make sure you stay in your bed all night. It hasn't even occurred to them <laughs> yeah. to get out. You're telling them to get out if you say that, <laughs> aren't you? Giving them the idea. It's like going, make sure you don't look under the carpet near the door for the key that's going to get you out of your jail cell sort of thing. Like yeah. it's, don't don't give them the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying bed suggests yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just saying you're, you're, they yeah. haven't even occurred You've to put them. put the idea in their head if you're saying don't get out of bed. Yeah, you just yeah. simply say, I will see, see in you in the morning. morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the end of this, this podcast is you finishing some sentences for me. Lovely. Uh, so, Eve, we'll start with you. Being a parent means... Oh. Being a parent means having a massive mirror held up in your face to show you all the things that you need to work on and mm. love yourself more and all the things that you get triggered by because our triggers, for me, are our signposts to healing yeah. mm. and basically reparenting yourself so that you're giving yourself enough love to give themselves permission to do the same and to love themselves that much too. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah, so much of our triggers in our kids' behaviour is from our oh, stuff. Yes. Our stuff. And yeah. that's, I, I love the triggers. They're pearls for me, the triggers. Yeah, so really? if I'm like, yeah. why do you always, and I'm really uh, irate, I go, not at the time, obviously, I just keep shouting, by the way, at the yeah. time. But later, I'll go, what was that about? And then I, I dig a bit and I keep yeah. digging. And then I go, oh, it was because I felt really embarrassed that I wasn't together this morning. So I was yeah. projecting about that. When did I last not feel together? And you need time yeah. and space to do that. And that's hard. But I, I think that the triggers are pearls for us yeah. to um, to shine um, up. Yeah. I love that so much. Mm. Gemma, being a parent means... Oh, my gosh, so much. And just wearing your heart outside of your body mm. in those little people that you love. And... I think it's parenting is beautiful, but it's also brutal. Yeah. And it can be those things simultaneously, can't yeah. it? So it's knowing that that is really normal. Next sentence. Mm. If I could tell you one thing, it would be... Gemma, why don't you go first mm. this time? Oh, my gosh. It's really normal to lose yourself when you're a mother. And a wise woman told me when I was pregnant with my first son 13 years ago that mothers are very good at finding things. <laughs> and you will find yourself. I love that flamingo analogy, how you yes. lose your pink, how flamingos lose their pink. Yeah. Um, and that it takes sometimes years to get that back, but but you will. So if you feel lost, that's okay. But you will find yourself because we're very good at mm. that. I love that. I love that. I remember someone saying to me in the thick of it with 406, you know, so uh, it was a friend who didn't have children. She said, so other than kids, what's going on for you? And I burst into tears because I did didn't have anything mm. else to say. There was nothing going on with yeah. me. I didn't know what music I liked, yeah. what food I liked, what my style of clothes were. It was basically dirty, unwashed was my style at the time. <laughs> um, so it but comes beautiful, back. no less. Thank you, my love. Oh. I would say, because I've not just got my sleep hat on here, G, I've got my, you know, life hat on, and I would say nothing changes if nothing changes. So if you want there to be change, if you want to feel like you're living your authentic life or feel rested or feel whatever, if it's not working for you now, yeah. you, you need to do something mm. different for it to feel different, you know. And finally, I'm happy when... I'm happy when I drown out all of the noise and yeah. anything that doesn't actually feel in alignment with what I feel. So I like to talk about this protective bubble and that is when I'm happiest, when mm. it's the six of us or other people that I let in, but drowning out the... Because there's so much information out there and yeah. so many shoulds. It's, it helps to take the pressure off and that's when I'm happiest and when my house is clean for a, about half a day. <laughs> that also makes me very happy. <laughs> True. Um, for me, it's those little moments that you talked about. So, mm. like the other day, my 14 year old had all these um, mess that he made outside with his friends. And he, for an hour, I had the broom in my hand and he would not go to tidy it up because he was embarrassed. Yeah. And my nine year old went, I'll come with you if you want, mate. I'll help you. And Finn said, mate, I'll give you five pounds of my allowance next month if you do. And he went, I won't take a penny. I'm doing it because I love you. Oh. That's what makes me happy. <laughs> that is so, so when my yeah. children display kindness to those in need, yeah. Yeah. then I go, 
I've nailed it. Yeah. And I don't care if and anything And those are the else. moments where you kind of elbow each other and go, look yeah. at this, oh look my at gosh. this. Yeah. Or you just t- stop and take a moment because I think there should. is so much other noise, there's so much other yeah. crap, there's so much expectation yeah. that we so place guilt. on them, so much guilt, yeah. so much pressure. Mm. And actually those little moments, they are so organic. Yes. And that is yeah. who they are. Yeah. That's, you That's know, ex- a way of all the demands yeah. and everything else and we place on them. dare I say it, we kind of did that in a way. We, yeah. we raised them like that. Yeah. And that's okay to take that moment yeah. and go, we're yeah. all right. We're doing Bit of all a right. pat on it's the back. It's all right. Mm. Yeah, it's all right. We're doing it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. It's okay.